All right, we are here. I really wanted to read a comic book today, and I wanted to read a Spider-Man comic book with a friend. And what greater friend could I think of than the webtacular Dave Howlett? Dave, hi. Hey, pal. Hello yourself. Look at you, you web slinger. I love it. I love it. The comic we're reading today is none other than Amazing Spider-Man 232, as seen here in this collected omnibus edition I have. Ooh, and you've got the real floppy. The real floppy from <laughs> straight off the spinner rack from uh, all the way back to a little year I like to call 1982. 232, written by the great Roger Stern, illustrated by John Romita Jr., who is still, as of 2024, is still drawing Spider-Man comics, which I think is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Roger Stern hasn't written a Spidey comic in a while. I want to talk about that as well. You know, Dave, we were talking about Spidey comics, and, you know, we both read a lot of Spider-Man comics, and I feel like the Roger Stern era increasingly now people don't talk about it as much like we know there was a whole sea change when the whole McFarlane everything started around 298 299 300 onwards and it seems like Spidey really took a different form um in storytelling you know a lot of great stories as well and of present comic day writers for Spidey I think I feel like Dan Slott might be the closest to capture a bit of that Roger Stern vibe. Um, really quick, because you are a big, I know you're a big expert on Roger Stern, among many other comics. Obviously, Avengers. Uh, he did Doctor Strange as well, which I actually haven't read that much of his run. I know he did the, the what's the one with Mignola? It was a, uh, just like a prestige comic, right? Mm, but yeah, Doctor that, well, that Doom and Doctor that. Strange. That was one of Marvel's original graphic novels, Doctor Strange, Doctor Doom, Triumph and Torment. Excellent book. Yes. Yes. Read that one. one the monthly too. I, I just recently read those for the first time, I think last year or the year before. And it's, I oh. recommend it. They're good and you can oh. get them cheap. Nice. And Captain America, right? That might have been his, yeah. was that his, I don't know if that was his first thing at Marvel. Do you, you know? I don't know. It's an early one. I don't know if it's his first. That's uh, with John Byrne, I think co-plotting. Like drawing it and co-plotting it, I think, but for sure, Byrne was drawing it. Okay, okay. Now, originally, we were going to talk about the kid who collected Spider-Man, which right. is another issue in the in the Roger Stern run. And then you suggested this one, and I was mm -hmm. like, "Yeah, all right, let's let's read it." Two thirty-two, featuring who's that big baddie on the cover, Dave? Calvin Zabo, aka Mr. Hyde. Uh, who Roger Stern, it turns out, has written him a bunch of times. Uh, he's in that Captain America run. He's in the Avengers Under Siege run, which is my favorite Avengers storyline. He's a crucial part of the Masters of Evil team on that. And uh, yeah, this was just, you know, one that I bought off the spinner rack as a kid and always liked it. And uh, it's part two, kind of a part two, but it doesn't matter. I didn't have part one when I was a kid and it didn't affect my enjoyment of it. Yeah, yeah. I went in wanting to just read it as a single issue to see, okay, can we read this comic just on its own? I, I mm -hmm. think you can. I did go read the issue before because it's in this collected edition from uh, the Spider-Man Masterpiece Edition, published by Wizard, of all publishers, in uh, December 2004 is the interior date. And this has, according to Wizard the 10 greatest Spider-Man stories ever. And it includes uh, the death of Gene DeWolf, Venom Strikes Back, uh, not the first Venom, the Venom Strikes Back, which we all remember when Venom is Spider-Man's father. And, uh, <laughs> nothing can... <laughs> and uh, nothing can stop the Juggernaut, another Roger Stern famous one. And the uh, 231, which is the, the issue prior to 232, obviously, mm -hmm. featuring Cobra, which, for weird reasons, I, of course, like. And uh, I will call out right now that in both 231 and 232, Spidey keeps calling Cobra Snake Eyes. And uh, This is the year G.I. Joe debuted, too, right? Like the, the Larry Hama incarnation. Wow. It's, right? So, was something in the office at the time? Was, was Roger sitting next to Larry uh, when they were coming up with characters? Three was out, so... 
Okay, so I got the checklist, so I can check this shit. Oh man, see that's why again, like you know, I oh single issues are always better. The collections are fun. It's fine. You had the single issue. Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to know about that. Do you remember when you first read this as a kid? Like what your impression? Like what made this such a cool issue for you? Uh, well, you know, when you're, I would have been eight when this came out. Like I said, I bought it off a spinner rack, probably at a drugstore in Sunnyside Mall in Bedford would be my guess. And, uh, you know, when you're a kid, any comic you get is precious to you. You know, you don't have the money to really buy your own most of the time. I was a huge Spider-Man fan. Uh, some of the first comics, some of the first reading I ever did was Spider-Man via the electric company's Spidey Super Stories. So I was very, always very excited to get a brand new one off the rack. Um, this is before I had a comic shop to go to and have a, an account anywhere, like a pull list or whatever. Um, so I was very excited to get my hands on. I think just that's a really badass cover. Like, you know, like a cool transformation sequence, but making sure Spider-Man is, uh, you know, geez, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, like a piece of the action here, getting him in the uh, on the ground, I think is really cool. Just an interesting cover. Like Al Milgram inks it, who I don't recall inking John Romita Jr. a lot before. He does some cool stuff where like, the blacks aren't totally black. They're sort of like, uh, you see what I mean? Like they're just kind of sketched in. Mm -hmm, look mm -hmm. An interesting move for both of them. Not something I've not really used to seeing Ramita or Milgram do, but I just thought that was a really striking image. And it's just a great issue of like Spider-Man up against somebody that he's just really no match for and uh, prevailing, you know, which I guess he'd really done before in the juggernaut storyline, a couple of issues earlier, but I hadn't read that one. So this yeah. Was, uh, new to me. I have to say, as a kid, Mr. Hyde, not a character that I got excited about. To me, yeah. I know you, in addition to being a superhero comic lover, um, <laughs> you love your monsters and your movie monsters. So to me, like any time a character like this appears, like, oh, we already have a Mr. Hyde. There's already Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Like, I've heard, you know, this is like a thing. It's kind of like, I was never that big into like Hercules, as much as I love some there are some great Hercules comics, but because I'm like, I was like, like the other Hercules, like the mythological Hercules. Like, oh, they're going to say the hero song and story from the anime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, Herc. Hey, Herc. Um, you know, that was my Hercules. I, so Mr. High was like, eh, really? We're just in it. So Stan Lee, he's Thor villain, right? Originally. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just kind of like, oh, you're just taking like, you know, give us a new guy. Plus, the Hulk already has that Dr. Jekyll. It's already a bit of that Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde uh, carryover, right? Um, mm -hmm. But this is a great issue. I think this, to me, for people who don't know uh, the context setting up this issue, Spidey has just tracked down Cobra. Uh, the villain, again, not the uh, super villain, not the super the uh, G.I. Joe antagonists. Um, and he's tracked down Cobra, and apparently Hyde has a bone to pick with Cobra because they used to be partners, and and now I think Cobra might be, like, flipping and, and about to give over some secrets. I'm not quite sure what their beef is. Um, like, he left him for dead or something? Do you know much? I think that's a reference back to the Captain America story that Stern and Byrne did a couple years earlier. Like, I, it's been a while since I read that one, but I think at some point... Cobra either double crossed him or left him for dead or something. And Hyde's obviously pretty bitter about it. Right. Well, he's, yeah. And there's a great line of dialogue here uh, where he's like, I, Hyde yell, is yelling at Cobra and he's like, you know, Cobra's like, I thought you were dead. And Hyde, Hyde is like, I survived because I knew you lived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get on this guy's bad side. <laughs> no, no. Uh, the dialogue in this issue is so, it's so fun. Uh, it's just like, Spidey is sharp. This is what I want in a Spider-Man comic. I want, you know, there's a lot, everything is happening here. Peter Parker's got problems, which is a constant, like such a Peter, like he goes back into his old science office at one point. And he's like, oh, he's like packing up because he's decided to quit his like TA job at the university or whatever. And he's sad because the school has a better typewriter than he does. He's like, oh, I'm going to miss this typewriter. It's better than the one I have at home. Like, Spider-Man can't get a good typewriter in 1982. Come on. Help the guy out. I mean, also, who's he typing? What's he typing? 
Well, I really like um, that sequence because that ties in with what's going on. Like those characters in that sequence, that's if you read Peter Parker, the spectacular Spider-Man at the same time, that was more his university life. Whereas amazing was him at the daily bugle. Obviously in both, he became Spider-Man or becomes Spider-Man and fights bad guys. But uh, I like that. They just did a little bit of continuity business there and acknowledge that there was changes happening over in Peter Parker too. Right, right. So yeah, let's talk about that for a second. This was a time when they were really experimenting with going back and forth, right? There was a spectacular series. And was that created basically because there were, people just wanted more Spider-Man? Like one title a month was not enough. I right? assume, yeah. Um, I don't have any hard data on that, but I just assume, yeah, it's like selling. Why wouldn't we sell twice as much? Yeah, like what was... I've heard it debated over the years when they had like the main three going for a while because Web would come a bit later. There was mm -hmm. Amazing Spider-Man, Spectacular, and Web of Spider-Man. And then plus Spidey would show up in like Marvel Team-Up, Marvel Tales. Like there are all well, these other ways to get your Spidey fix. There still are. But at the time I heard it was like Spectacular was supposed to cover maybe his supporting cast because the supporting cast had gotten so big. And then web of was because he had so many villains that they really wanted to make it like a monthly villain feature. Did you, have you heard that theory? Or I have not heard that theory. Like I said, for, for me, I always took it as with Peter Parker, we're going to focus on his, his uh, academic life and the whole different supporting cast of his university classmates and teachers and stuff. Whereas amazing dealt more with him, at the Daily Bugle, J. Jonah Jameson and Betty Brant and Ned Leeds. Um, but I don't know that there was any specific agenda. I think just kind of a way to differentiate the two. As far as web goes, I never really bought web regularly, so I can't speak to that. I bought, I think the first time I bought it was when they did Craven's Last Hunt five years later after this mm -hmm. storyline. Yeah. I mean, web definitely features a lot of uh, the less exciting. Spidey <laughs> villains. Um, <laughs> like you're not into the <laughs> I mean, hey, look, I love Rocket Racer. You know, I love, you know, Mindworm. Is Mindworm the really creepy one? That's we've talked about him before. Yeah, Mindworm was yeah. from Amazing, though. He was like a 70s yeah. character. Madness is the Mindworm. Yeah, He's that dead. is a creepy. We'll, we'll, we should dig that one up, too. Oh, yeah, um, okay. So back to this real quick. Hyde has been chasing Cobra. Cobra has been apprehended by Spidey because Cobra was about to give some information to an investigative reporter. I think it was Ned Leeds and Marla, who's J, J. Jonah Jameson's wife, but I don't think they're married at this point. No, yeah, they're not married yet. And uh, Lance Bannon is the photographer that's with him that was sort of like a, a Peter Parker rival at that point. Yeah, so pre-Eddie Brock, he really was a big rival for for Peter. Um, and like Peter really doesn't like him, <laughs> which comes up <laughs> and he's kind of a jerk, right? Like yeah, Spidey yeah. saves his, him from falling off a building, but his camera breaks. And then Lance is like, oh yeah, there's a good line. I know we're going to talk about our dialogue, but now there's a line where Lance is like, uh, he's critiquing Peter Parker's photography and he's like, <laughs> yeah. Lousy that. composition, but great <laughs> angles. <laughs> you can tell he takes risks. So, uh, you know, that is one compliment. But then he seems to be, he's really like stealing all Peter's jobs at this point, right? That's why Peter has to work at the at the lab. Is that it? To get extra cash? Uh, I think he always just needs extra cash. I don't know that he's taking all this job. But I think, you know, he's got a rival now. Someone else trying to make their name taking spidey shots. And, uh, you know, maybe his compositions are better because he's not... Right you know, almost being killed by Doc Ock or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so speaking of compositions, art-wise, J.R.J.R., John Romita Jr., mm -hmm. how early into his career is this? This is a couple years in, but this is his initial run on Amazing Spider-Man, initial of uh, several. Um, but, you know, before this, he did a stint on Iron Man with, Bob Layton, I think, and David Michelini writing it, Layton co-plotting and inking it. Um, I know I've seen him on some other stuff before this, but uh, Iron Man is the big one that I can think of that predates this. Mm -hmm. so this is pretty early on. Yeah, his stuff, do you think, to me it kind of reads at this stage in his career, he's still, he's very much in that Marvel house style, and you can really see 
John Romita Sr., I think, in a lot of his Absolutely. work here, naturally, which is not a bad thing. You know, my favorite no, no. Spidey artist, obviously. Um, so, but years later, we know that John Romita Jr. would, his stuff gets, it definitely takes on its own style, which is amazing in itself, and it's so recognizable. Um, I think also, yeah, the inking plays a big part here. Um, yeah, like, Jim Mooney is kind of like an old school guy. I think he definitely reigns it in, and, you know, as you say, it deals it's more to the house style of the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of consistency. Did you have a favorite panel in the in the issue? Is there one in particular that when you see, you're like, oh, I get, you get that rush? Uh, what I really like is just this shot of Spidey's head here in this corner one there. Just a really good dramatic, like the lighting is super cool, like... Just the Dude, cool I was going to pick the same one. Yeah. It's, it's just so simple. It's tucked away in the corner. Yep. And it's like a perfect Spidey head, you know? I also, as a follow-up or as a, a runner up, I'm going to say, no, oh, geez, this sequence here is great too. It's, it's like a Gil Kane, uh, they call it the DeLuca effect, I guess. When you see sort of the after images of them jumping around, I think yeah. that looks cool. This, this jaw is such a great, like just great Spidey action. For me, he just kind of had it. I mean, it was in his blood, right? <laughs> he knew how to he knew how to do it. Is radioactive Romita <laughs> Romita active blood? Maybe yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll take it. That's all right. <laughs> um, Roger Stern's writing style as well. One thing, and very much of the era for Marvel stuff and seventies stuff, which you don't see that much now. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of descriptors in, like, the caption boxes, mm-hmm. and a lot of, a lot of the script is describing what's happening on the page, mm-hmm. as opposed to letting the artist just illustrate. Oh, look! He's twisting his arm and throwing his, you know whatever he's throwing the water tower at spider-man but in this you know the narrative is sort of describing what's happening as you're looking at the picture or even adding a little extra um that to me i found is like okay this is kind of like a lost style of the writing because this very much feels like a 1982 comic book which is not a bad thing at all this feels like the stuff i would get excited about reading uh, as a kid and now, um, but you know what I mean? Like the nimble web slinger skitters down the street, uh, skitters down to street level where like, it's just like a lot of descriptions in there. Like, did you notice anything like, you know, you've been on a bit of a binge of older comics lately, so uh, it might not you stand know, out as much. Yeah. I don't really notice it as much because I'm just so used to it. Like, you know, we grew up on this shit. So like, to yeah. me, it's just, this was written, I was eight years old. It was written for kids at this point. I think they wanted to make sure they weren't confused. So they kind of hold your hand through it a little bit. There's also like the Jim Shooter ethic of the time of like every comic is potentially someone's first. So you don't want them to feel confused or lost. You want to constantly bring them up to speed, make sure they know who everybody is and what their relationships with each other are. Even though there are ways of doing that in the dialogue and in the action. But I think, uh, you know, they were just writing to a younger audience. Or so they thought. You read the letters pages, it's, it's all grown-ups writing in, so I don't know when it was ever just kids reading them. Yeah, what, what any uh, fun letters? Because that's something I miss from the collection. Uh, I don't get the letters. Nothing, nothing really stood out. You know, I always look to see if there's future pros that write in, because you often see, you know, like you see Kurt Busiek in a lot of these. Frank Miller's got a letter in an issue of Amazing Spider-Man a couple years before this. Um, and there's also, like, uh, letter hacks of the day that you would see all the time, like TM Maple and Lone Wolf and, you know, just names that would pop up over and over again across Marvel, DC, or whatever. But there wasn't anything that really stood out to me this time. Mm. What about the ads? You got some good ads in there, right? Uh, always good ads. I mean, this is like... <laughs> we were talking last week about G.I. Joe being used to sell the military-industrial complex to children. Check this out. <laughs> like... Announcing <laughs> a new military buildup in America. Wow. And what is that for? Just at the bottom, oh, I can't yeah. see yeah, Models, like NPC yeah. model kits. But then also, as I said in the back, I showed you earlier. Um, Is moving oh, a bit? I can't quite see. Yeah. So we froze oh, up. Oh, yeah. First. Deeds, not words. Oh, I man. Have you seen this movie yet? Yes, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Terrible. Wow. Terrible movie. But uh, that's wow. my favorite album on here, though. And I only actually got to finally see it for myself a couple of years ago. And uh, it's pretty funny. It's basically like, yeah, we're going to have uh, 
dirt bikes and colored smoke bombs. And that's going to be our arsenal against bad guys. Um, <laughs> very boss with, with magnificently uh, coiffed hair. <laughs> yeah, that was the hairstyle back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, back to the describing what's happening. Um, it was actually in 231 because I went back and read it. But there's a panel I'll just show you right here. I don't know. Can we see? So it's kind of blurry. Yeah. So Cobra is creeping down this, the side of the wall. And right uh, here, Spidey's got, I know you can't read it, but I'll read it to you. Spidey has uh, a thought bubble. I hate it when he uh, when he moves around like that, you know. And he moves his head back and forth. And he's like a cobra. And he's basically just describing that we can't see that cobra is basically slithering down the wall like a cobra. And it's just types of dialogue like that, um, which, you know, to me, it's like, oh, yeah, this is very sterny and this is very much of the time. Um, so Hyde, let's, can we talk about his powers for a second? Uh, he, he carries little vials in his vest. Is that it? Mm -hmm. And and he uses those to transform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like he has a serum that kind of hulks him out in a way. And uh, but he doesn't seem to really have a different personality when he becomes Hyde. Like he kind of seems like he's villainous in both of his personas. But like I really most of the time have only ever seen him as Hyde. Like this is a rare instance of me seeing Doctor Calvin Zabo. Like every other story I know him from, he's just running around as Mister Hyde wrecking stuff. Yeah, and he, but he similar to Hulk, how Hulk would kind of get resentful of Banner and be like, oh, puny Banner. Hyde does that a bit here, where mm -hmm. he's like kind of resenting. He's like, I think I should get rid of the doctor. Um, but what happens when he runs out of vials? I guess he just keep goes and makes more or like the doctor makes yeah, more? Yeah, just makes more. I don't know. I, yeah. I have no idea like, how much of this stuff he has or how often he needs to refill it or how much he needs. I don't know. Yeah, uh, but just great, like, nonstop action. Like, every page is happening. So at one point, you know, talking about Peter Parker's private life, he's swinging around. He drops Hyde off, Hyde and Cobra off a building, and he just leaves them there. He's like, they're webbed up. They'll be okay, because he sees a clock, and he's like, oh, man, it's quarter to five. I have to go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when he goes to clean out his desk. And he misses his surprise party. They're trying, his, his former co-workers are trying to lure him into the staff room to throw him a surprise party. But Peter's like, no, I, I got to go because he's got to get back, right? That was... Well, you know, maybe uh, maybe he really didn't want to go to a party and his spider sense warned him. <laughs> like, don't go in there. There's... <laughs> oh, how, how, how can you act surprised when you've got spider sense, right? <laughs> That's right. And then when Hyde, like, he, when he finally beats Hyde, like, the spider, Spidey sense is, like, really advanced. Like, it turned itself off in advance. He's like, oh, I don't feel Spidey sense anymore. I guess it knows that Hyde is about to pass out. Like, wow, it's very intuitive. Well, I always find the depiction of the spider sense is uh, <laughs> very plot dependent, you know? Like, if it worked perfectly all the time, then there wouldn't really be a whole lot of danger for him. So it's kind of a deus ex machina sometimes i find i don't know i don't know how consistently it's portrayed yeah yeah um what what are some other favorite moments for you in the book uh well you know like i said peter parker um peter parker soap opera stuff is an essential part of the ingredients to a good spider-man story like you got to cut away and get some private live stuff going on um i do love the lance band and rescue and Lance giving him shit about not saving his camera. So Spidey webs his mouth up. Always, you know, used to seeing that done to J. Jonah Jameson, but nice to see him pull it on somebody else. That's one thing this mission, this issue could use is some J. Jonah Jameson. I don't think there's any JJJ in here. Um, but I do like, uh, yeah, I don't know. The, all the stuff with Hyde and uh, Cobra is a lot of fun because he just wants to kill him so bad. And he's like, he's just, I don't know. Like, I just love a bad guy that's just a, pure evil like he's not complicated there's no redemption in this guy he's just a jerk and you know this old partner of him he's gonna he says he's gonna like slowly rip him limb from limb or something and he wants him alive while he does it like oh yeah when i what does he say i curse the day i ever agree to be your partner we'll dispense with this false beard i want you in full costume when i slowly meticulously rip the life from your body <laughs> i don't know what different the costume would make but 
<laughs> and we should note the false beard. There's a great, like, wow, like, Cobra really thinks ahead. Like, yes. so Hyde is like, all right, we're going to sneak back to your getaway, and your get, you've got a hideaway somewhere, and he lives in, like, some, like, huge condo and like, you know, right in the middle of Manhattan or something. It's like, oh, nice place. So he's like, but I imagine, the, you know, the police know who you are, so you must have a, you know, some kind of disguise. <laughs> and Cobra's like, yes, I keep a false beard. I keep an extra in my helmet lining in case. So he's re- Now I'm like imagining every time I see Cobra that in his Cobra mask helmet, in the lining, he keeps a fake beard. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like you never I mean, know when you might need it. <laughs> the you know the foresight of these villains it, it was phenomenal. And you're right, Hyde is he's just a jerk. Um, a cool thing that we didn't touch on: Spidey winds up foiling these guys. It starts out because he webs he webs up Cobra's head, mm-hmm. and then throws Cobra at Hyde. And Hyde catches him and then winds up getting Cobra stuck to his hand the whole time. So then right. Hyde is like fighting Spidey while he's like whipping around Cobra on his hand, which is actually is, is a lot of fun. Um, and I feel like we've seen this stuff, like a lot of this stuff, I'm like, I've seen this later on in comics. Like, I think this must have been a very influential issue for a lot of creators and uh, and others. Um, oh yeah, I'm just looking at the panel where Spidey throws Cobra. Ah, there we go. Mm. And uh, <laughs> and Cobra's like, "What are you? No! <laughs> like, why are you surprised that Spider-Man is throwing you? I mean, you're fighting the guy. It's like, <laughs> no, what are you? Um, where every panel must have dialogue. <laughs> and Hyde keeps talking about in his hands, any mass is a weapon. Yeah. So that just means like he can pick up anything and throw it at you. Yeah, basically. (laughs) You know, it's like uh, with bullseye, it's like any object can be a deadly weapon, but he's just a lot less subtle with it. He'll pick up a chimney and throw it at you. Uh, He's quite eloquent. I must say Uh, Hyde has, has a lot of good dialogue. Um, any other uh, word word balloons you really like, and you have to read it out loud. Well, I was just going to say, I also like the element of Spider Man twisted his ankle in the last issue, so he's not operating at full capacity. And I always really like that, you know, put obstacles in front of your hero, like don't make it easy for him. You know, he's got to mm-hmm. overcome some stuff, so like just kind of constantly be finding some new thing that he has to overcome. In this case, it's a busted ankle or a twisted ankle. Um, so you know, just good good writing there. You don't want to make it too easy for him. Um, my favorite probably line of dialogue, and this is one that made a huge impression on me when I was a kid. It's always good, of course, Spider-Man trash-talking his villains and, uh, you know, kind of just making them angry. But the part where they're running around Cobra's condo fighting, his deluxe condo here, and uh, Hyde chases him into a bunch of, like, a, a, a garden here. And Spider-Man says, try being more mellow, like me, like the song says. You got to take time to stop and smell the roses, or in this case, the ferns. Here, have a snoo fill on me. And then the sound effect is... Boom! As he bops Mr. Head, Mr. Hyde's head into the ferns, who then comes back up with, "Why are you dirty, son of a thwap?" <laughs> he like webs his face up. So another facial webbing, very good. But I also like him getting angry and losing his eloquence and about to call him a dirty son of a bitch. Delightful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the Spidey quips are bang on. Like the dialogue, he's he's really you know Stern is really firing on all cylinders in terms of of getting that good spider banter. Mm-hmm. Um, which again, pure Spidey. It's fun. You know, again, like whenever you read comics pre, like we talk about it all the time, but pre Dark Knight Returns, pre, mm-hmm. you know, that whole sea change, pre Watchmen. I mean, this is like, obviously those are great comics as well, but there was a different the landscape is different. It's like watching sci-fi before Star Wars came out, right? You can definitely see there things were done a different way. There's like, sometimes the pacing seems a bit strange. Sometimes characters act a different way, but there's like, it's grounded in a different reality than I think the post Dark Knight comics were. Like, whether 
creators admit it or not, it's kind of hard not to think of that. I think in a lot of uh, a lot of the superhero comics that came in the later '80s and '90s, um, this is a fun pocket. So Roger Stern, he was on Spidey for like at least ten years, right? Like it, it was a long. No, it run. wasn't that long. Like he was no? on like not that long before this until I think about '87 or '88. Uh, so not quite ten years, like probably like six or seven. But he left. I want to say in the two seventies or two eighties, something that kind of happened a lot with him was like leaving over creative differences. Like in this case, it was the origin of the hobgoblin. Like he was, he had it set up. This is a character. He wrote Peter Parker before he wrote this. And over Peter Parker, I think, I believe he introduced the character of Roderick Kingsley, who was a fashion mogul and who was, who was going to be the hobgoblin when his identity was eventually revealed. But then Marvel wanted it to be Ned Leeds. And he was sort of like, this contradicts, stories i've set up already i don't agree with this so he ended up leaving the book because of that he left avengers because of creative differences i don't know if you know this story but uh he made he co-created marvel right marvel with john romita jr they introduced her in an annual in amazing spider-man and then uh he eventually made her chairwoman of the team and then eventually mark grunwald possibly on orders from higher up came to him and said we want captain america in charge again we want captain marvel to screw up so bad that captain america has to come back and fix everything and he was just like that's ridiculous. I don't want to do that. So he quit. And then somebody, Tom DeFalco came in and did it instead for him. Uh, I think he also left Dr. Strange for creative differences. Uh, I don't know what they were. I don't remember. Um, but then I was shortly after Spider-Man, he went over to DC for a bit because he wrote the relaunch mm -hmm. of Starman. And I don't know that he ever did much else for anybody really. Like the only like kind of latter day credit I can really think of. He did a couple of little things at Marvel. He came back and did, there was a was Hobgoblin a miniseries, right? I do yeah, remember well, that. Yeah, I think where they kind of retconned it or went back to explain, oh, Roderick Kingsley actually was the Hobgoblin. But uh, he he also wrote the Superman versus the Hulk one shot when they were doing all those crossovers that was illustrated by Steve Rude. That's a good oh, one. Oh, yeah. And, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. He might have been the first writer on the Heroes for Hire series in the 90s that they brought back. Is like early, early Pascal Ferry drawing it. Um, like he would just sort of pop up here and there, but never for very long. And, uh, I don't know what he's up to now. No, it's great. And like the way he handles different characters and the pacing and he crams everything in the supporting cast is really interesting. Obviously the hobgoblin issues, like for anyone tuning into this, who, who isn't familiar, like, yeah, go look up that stuff. Like the run of Roger Stern, like, it's funny. Like I was trying to think, like, I've definitely read this. It was a long time ago. I don't even know where. I read it before. Maybe I probably have the issue buried away in some. I've got like a giant run of Spidey, um, and I've read it a lot of Roger Stern stuff. And this is all just kind of flooding back to me as as I was reading it. I know I thought he was somehow involved in the marriage of Peter Parker, but I think he he was like against it, right? And because he did come back, he came back during that. I think it was the brand new day era. Mm -hmm. I think there was like when they were rotating creators. Do you remember they were doing like it was like yeah. almost like bi weekly? Um, yeah, McNiven had that story. You know, Slot was on there. There's a whole bunch of guys Mark working Wade, on it. Mark Martin was a lot of yeah, people. yeah. And I, I feel like he might have come back then because I feel I feel like in more recent times I've I've read some other Spidey stuff. Uh, but um, and yeah, that hobgoblin thing he came back to do. I think it came out around the clone era, which a lot of the there was a lot of stuff that people kind of missed out on. Um, yeah, it was late stuff. 90s, I think. I think yeah, late... yeah. Um, but a great, you know what? This is a fun standalone issue. Definitely, I think if people are looking for a Spidey comic of this era, you know, the pre Venom, the pre Wedding pre dark knight returns if you will like S spidey era uh this is a nice uh a nice pocket um dave any other last thoughts on this that we didn't cover um i, mean, I, just, I don't know i uh i just i gotta i love john Romita jr a lot especially like i love i love what he kind of evolved into but i really like early stuff like this where you're seeing it kind of you can sort of see it in some of his layouts and some of his figures that he would go into that kind of blockier style um i don't know i don't know what else to say uh <laughs> i don't know that it's I'm, I'm surprised to see it in that collection because it's not one that i really hear talked about a lot but 
it's just one of those ones that made a big impression on me. Like it, I'm not going to say it's for sure the first brand new issue of Spider-Man that I bought off the rack, but it's got to be up there. Like it's one of the, like I would get a lot, like my mom would always see one, like she would just bring me home a Spider-Man comic if she saw one at the flea market or something like that. So I had a lot, and I had a lot of like Marvel Tales reprints and whatnot, whatnot, but like as a monthly Spider-Man book, this may be one of the first ones, this may be the first one I ever had. So obviously made a huge impression. Also really like this moment, just a cool scene I liked when the, Hyde throws that chimney and when it hits the street, it lands on a cab and the poor cab driver is sitting behind the wheel. He's, he's okay, but he's just covered in glass and just shaking like a leaf and just like, sure. In a, in a, uh, a minute I'll wake up and everything will be fine. You know, they're like, Oh my God, this poor guy's in shock. Call an ambulance. He's going to be killed. I just like little touches like that to remind you that the potential for collateral damage is there. Spidey's, you know, always trying to look out for the poor guy on the street that might get crushed by a runaway chimney. Yeah, totally. This is the Peter Parker that, you know, we love. This is the one I grew up with. It's like he's always worried about his fellow man. Mm -hmm. He's got all these problems in his own life, but he doesn't care that he can't afford a good typewriter. He needs to make sure that, you know, Aunt May can can make her wheat cakes or get to the doctor on time or whatever. And like, yeah, here's like another hide throwing stuff. There's this great dialogue in the thought bubble and Spidey goes, uh, if that thing had connected, I'd have a new haircut at shoulder level. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another scene I really like, too. We talked about uh, Hyde in his Calvin Zabo identity, taking Klaus Voorhees, who was Cobra, back to his luxury condo and running into the doorman. He's like, oh, he just had too much to drink. I'm going to get him home. And the, the doorman realizes, like, he looks at, what's that he's wearing on his feet? Snakeskin boots. Well, I guess it takes all kinds. You know, he sees his supervillain costume underneath his trench coat. Just a good moment. Love it. Uh, it takes yeah. all kinds. What We're a great thing. Day there, Claus, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the doorman's, you know, can be a little tighter security on that place. But, uh, oh, man, great. This was awesome, Dave. Thank you so much. You know, you, you know. I love chatting comics with you. I, and I really wanted to read a comic with you today. So thank you. Well, I know I, what we're going to read next. I oh, dug it up. Oh, well, you tell we, Oh yes. We, we talked about this. Yes. Very exciting. Yes. So find your soft boy. If people don't know this one, woo, Good soft boy. I'll have it. <laughs> yeah. Special jumbo double issue. Oh, reprint. This is the reprint one. So I, I think I've got the uh, originals around somewhere. Mm, I think I'll that's collect. What I have. This is the double combo. Oh my gosh. I'm looking forward to reading this with you. <laughs> I'll uh, also dig up my soft boy vinyl figure. I've got that somewhere. Yes. Too. Yes. Soft boy. So uh, a bit of a departure from Hyde, which was, and you know what? what the title's not called Hide and Seek. I kept wanting it's to call it Hide and Seek. Plain sight. Hide and played sight. Yes, I think. And there you go. I bet Roger Stern was like, hide and seek was probably too easy. Or he <laughs> used it on Captain America or something. <laughs> but yeah, hide in plain sight. And hide is originally a Stan Lee character, I believe. Uh, I'm going to say a Stan Lee and Jack Kirby character. Uh, did Kirby work on it? Because on Thor, uh, yeah. obviously, I'm sure he did. Yeah. In Thor, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, Kirby, you know, Kirby probably did create everybody. <laughs> Kirby probably came up with it and Stan just filled in the word balloons. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, he definitely has a Kirby look to him, right? He's got that, like, even when he's, when Ramita draws him as well, he's got a, mm -hmm. that. Kind of an odd pairing, though, a eh? Hyde and Cobra. Like, uh, like, I love a good supervillain team up, but it's just like, Usually there's some sort of connecting thread there, like Hyde and, you know, like Jekyll and Hyde, I guess, but Hyde and Cobra. I don't know what the, like, yeah. there's no sort of animal name significance tying them together or like, I, do you know what I mean? Like, there's, yep. it's just sort of like a very random team up of it's two guys with completely different uh, villain methodologies and code names who just decide to throw in together and fight Thor. <laughs> Doesn't seem like yeah. a great idea to me, but... <laughs> I mean, it looks cool on a cover, I guess. They sure. want the like guy in the cobra costume. They're like they want the hide character and um mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh I, I agree. Not not a match you would automatically think of. But the Captain Where America is... featuring these mm -hmm. guys is great too, because it's also got Batrock the Leaper in it, another favorite. Yes. Oh, yeah. Anything with Batrock rules. Mm -hmm. Where is Hyde today? 
Like, I feel like I haven't seen him pop up in a comic in a long time. I saw him very recently. Um, he was in, you know, they, they rebranded, like they came up with a new Punisher character. There's like yep. a new guy wearing the suit. who has got a new mission and whatnot. Um, he was in that series in issue one or two of that. Okay. Um, he seems to be the guy that they bust out whenever there's like drug stuff involved because I guess because he's taking drugs, but like when they did the Robbie Reyes ghost rider series, when they introduced that version of the character, he was the villain in that first arc too. And I think it was like, he was running drugs in the neighborhood or something like that, or mm -hmm. selling hide formula or mutant growth hormone or whatever it was. Yeah. So about, he's around, he's in the mix. He's good. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. I, I do. It's funny. Like the more we talk about, it, the more I feel like, Again, growing up, like as I was reading comics and like Mr. Hyde would appear, it wasn't a character again that I would get excited about. Mm -hmm. This is a good issue, but I'm like, Hyde is not like, eh, it's like the owl. Like there are characters like that where I'm just like, oh, I'm not that like excited to read about the owl or Mr. Hyde or like, like guys like that. Right. Well, I mean, I've got a nostalgic fondness for him largely because of this issue, but also I mentioned earlier, the Avengers under siege storyline, mm -hmm. which is Stern and John Buscema and he is really evil in that like he makes a yeah. huge impression because like they, they've got Captain America tied up and they're going through the lockers of all the Avengers and messing with their stuff the, the, the Masters of Evil taking over the mansion and they're just basically wrecking everybody's shit and they're going through Captain America's locker while he's tied to a chair and he takes out his old triangular shield and he's like crumples it up in front of him because it's not indestructible like his current shield and then he finds like Captain America's only surviving photo of his mother who died when he was a child tears it up in front of him and it's just like you know eventually oh and he tortures Jarvis like the poor butler like he mostly off camera or off panel but like really tortures him, nearly kills him and makes him consider quitting working for the Avengers. But yeah, he just made a huge impression as like a terrifying yeah. villain in that storyline. That's a, you're right. That's a bit. And that's, those are great issues. I've got to go back and reread, but I, uh, I do remember that. It's funny. Hide his, hide his. He's a dick, man. He's a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Captain America gets him back good by the end of it. But yeah, what a, what a prick. More like Dr. Jerkle. Oh, wait, what? No, what? He's not even. No, I'll stop. That. I could. I will try. I'll next time for soft boy. We'll do it. And, uh, and many others. Dave, thanks for reading a comic with me. Oh, always, man. This isn't even the first, only comic I read today. I'm probably going to read another. You go at it, sir. You know? more, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Takes all kinds. Takes all kinds. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get uh, some lime pop, uh, some bonkers, oh, some jelly tots, uh, I want a watermelon ring pop, and oh, moon mist ice cream. Yo, yo, is that a spinner rack? Yo, hold my moon mist. Hidden in the back, it was a trap for any kid who had a bit of cash, wandering in just to get a snack, past the Twix and the Snickers and the sticker packs, beyond the brick of brack there was a spinner rack, jam-packed full of comics, yeah, it was crack, for any little whippersnap who was into that, superheroes and the villains all getting smashed, the kind of stuff that your parents ditched in the trash, infinite stacks, living in a mix and match, full color, every cover was a different clash, some would get hacked while others stayed mint intact, time was limited, you know you had to pick it fast in a flash, cause the minutes didn't last, dash, planning every visit to the max with an itch to scratch, man, I give myself a rash, Anytime a spinner rack was within my grasp